The Glitch Attraction is a Final Fantasy Freddy's fan game that is centered around individual escape rooms. Basically, you go into these rooms and you have to solve various puzzles inside of them while not trying to die, and then you can proceed on to the next challenge. And honestly, I think this concept is really cool for a Final Fantasy Freddy's game. So today, we're gonna do what I do best, and we're gonna break this game and take a look at how it works behind the scenes. In this video, we're gonna cover the first title screen, the intro area to this game, and ultimately, the Final Fantasy Freddy's 4 nightmare escape room that is near the start of the game. So I hope you enjoy this quick look at things that you're not supposed to see. So let's do a very, very quick rundown of this entire area, just so you have it fresh in your mind for the things I'll be covering. So you show up to this establishment and you talk to a welcome bot and then you eventually hand over your backpack. After this happens, you proceed to the next room, which is the stage room. This is like the party room. So you have the animatronics on stage doing a performance and behind you, there is the pirate cove for Foxy. So you go up to this, you get a flashlight from Foxy, and then you crawl into a vent. And this vent takes you to the Finest of Freddy's 4 bedroom themed escape room where the actual challenge plays out. In this bedroom, you must find two keys and a combination to the safe. You have to manage the curtains to block Nightmare Fredbear, flash your light on Balloon Boy to prevent him from moving, hide in the Golden Freddy costume to avoid the marionette, dismiss the crazy little dude so you don't go insane, and last but not least, escape the room before time runs out and Nightmare Bonnie spawns. So you'll need two keys, and these are randomly spawned around the room, I believe? And you take these two keys and open the mysterious sealed box, which gives you a little tile piece. And this tile piece goes into the puzzle in the corner, and after you solve it, the safe code is behind that puzzle. You take the safe code, unlock the safe, get a hammer, pry the wooden beams off the door, and you successfully escape the room. So that's what happens here. So now we're going to rewind time and go back to the beginning. So back at the title screen, this is what that room looks like with a zoom out. It's actually a pretty big room. And what's actually interesting is that although you cannot see it, there's actually an invisible vanny in this room. So if we were to re-enable the Vanny model, this is what it looks like. It's just sort of standing here. And I'm going to be honest, I haven't played this game all the way through yet, so I don't know if this plays a role later, but it makes me think that this Vanny model is here frozen because with the light, it casts a shadow on the wall. So the thing about this game is, as you progress, the title screen constantly changes. And the first major change we have is actually centered around that first escape room. So as you can see, this title screen now has the escape room visible. And on the screen, there's all these different animatronics popping in and out. You have Balloon Boy popping in from different sides of the room. You have the marionette sort of like creeping out from beneath the bed. And you have Nightmare Fredbear who's sort of walking in from the right side of the screen. And this goes on for a while. And there's lots of different variations and combinations of where the different characters can show up. But if we move the camera backwards, you can see the illusions sort of break. You can see that Balloon Boy is quite literally just popping out of the wall. His legs are always behind the wall, but his upper torso pokes through. And I was super curious about the marionette because I want to see what was happening as it went beneath the bed. And it turns out the marionette is beneath the map with its super, super long legs. And it just sort of pokes through the floor. All the characters in this room sort of snap into place too. So you'll notice as I move the camera around and get different views on this room that the various characters are sort of just popping into place. And it's kind of funny, but Nightmare Fredbear just straight up walks through a wall and he'll just wait out of bounds until it's his time again to step back into frame. But honestly, this title screen is really, really cool. And the developers did an excellent job bringing it to life in a very creative way. So now we're gonna move on from the title screen and go to the opening cutscene. And we'll only stay here for a second because it's just a panning shot in an office, but this is what the office looks like from a different perspective. So now let's go to the very start of the game. So as the welcome bot finishes his dialogue, well, we have to give our backpack to this other robot. And this other robot turns around and goes around a corner and that's all we see. So of course, I wanted to see where the robot was going. So I moved behind this small little barricade and walked down the hallway. So it turns out the robot just kind of goes into this back corner and his arms are like clipping through the back of his body. They're like behind him. It's a bit weird because he's supposed to be holding the backpack in front of him. But uh, yeah, he's just stored back here like this. But it is kind of neat seeing this whole area from out of bounds because you can see through every wall and see the stage room from back here too. Now earlier I mentioned that Foxy gave you a flashlight and then Foxy disappears into the pirate cove. So this is what Foxy looks like behind the curtain. 
Foxy is just frozen in the last frame of their animation. But now it's time to leave this really, really chipper stage area and head into the vents to reach the escape room challenge. So now that we're in the bedroom, let's talk about a few different things. Starting off earlier, I mentioned the puzzle on the wall. Now, what's interesting about this is if you go out of bounds, there's actually the safe combination written on the wall. And it's just plain text. And this plain text can never be seen by the player, but it is right here, just out of bounds, right beyond that puzzle. There's also a lot of trees out here. And these trees normally can't be seen 100% because they are obscured by the window, but you can see them here. And if we head around back, as we rotate around this room, we'll find another room where the marionette comes from. So we can actually see what's behind that hole in the wall, the one that's boarded up, where the marionette comes out of. And there's like this creepy black fog, like this growing cloud of darkness that the tentacles eventually come out of. And it's kind of creepy, but here's a close up of the marionette's tentacles coming out from that very hole. Now let's make this place a little less creepy. So I turned on all the lights in the room and I deleted all the animatronics that could attack us. And I gotta say, it's a lot cozier this way. Of course, all the interesting things are off right now, so we're going to rewind time and tackle some different things. So when we first enter those vents to crawl into this room, something really interesting happens to the game. It unloads the area we just came from, but then it loads the bedroom on top of that same area. So the vents we're crawling through are like a U-shape. They are two right angles that lead you into the bedroom. So what's neat is after we beat this puzzle, we go through these closet doors and there's a hallway there but this hallway is actually in the same position of the stage room. So the vents that we're crawling through, if we were to go backwards, they actually now lead into the exit hallway that we need to get into. And you know, that's the magic of game design because most players would not realize this. So this building we're in is not really cohesive. The rooms inside of it actually overlap on top of each other and they must be unloaded in order to not cross over. So for example, if we hide inside the vents when Balloon Boy is trying to kill us, Balloon Boy will get up from the chair, walk through the closet, and then take a left through the wall. They will then walk through the vents and then kill us inside the vents. And this is because of the overlapping geometry. It's all a walkable surface for Balloon Boy. And just in case you're curious, the marionette can also kill us inside the vent. We are not safe in there. So something else you cannot see normally very well is Nightmare Fredbear outside the window. He will appear in the trees and you have to close the window so he doesn't kill you. But the window glass is kind of frosted. We can't really see out the window 100%. It's a little bit distorted, but this is what Nightmare Fredbear looks like when he's outside in the trees. So you can see he's just floating out here and he's just standing within the trees. Now, the final thing I wanted to test was to see if Balloon Boy could get me if I was up on the bed, but not just standing on the bed. No, I want to move the bed above the room and turn it into a floating platform. Balloon Boy gets off his chair and he normally walks up to you in the room and kills you. And I know for a fact he can get me anywhere on the ground. So I move the bed into the sky and then I'm sitting on top of it. And then I decide to add Balloon Boy back to the map. And I'm just waiting up there, anticipating that he's going to get off the chair and just walk straight up to me and kill me. But it turns out he gets off the chair and his logic just breaks. Because there's no ground he can walk to to get to me, well, he just walks in place, all scary-like. Luckily, I am safe up here. But if I step off this bed, well, I'm gonna die. The glitched attraction's second escape room is called Toys, and it is themed after Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Within it, we must avoid Toy Chica, Mangle, Withered Freddy, and Vanny. She's somewhere, or at least there is an achievement for her, but this is of course horoscoped, where we put your favorite horror games under the scope, and uh, break them. So I hope you're ready for behind the scenes looks, a very wide Chica, and a hidden room. As always, I hope you enjoy. So after the very first escape room, we go through a hallway and we find ourselves in the second. Now in this area, we have to hide in various lockers while we avoid Chica and Mangold as we make our way around this circular room. Our goal is to find hidden code pieces all around this entire area. And once we get these code pieces, we then punch in the combination into the panel and then we open this metal door. Now after this, we have to turn on the power and at this point, we have to worry about Withered Freddy escaping his case. So we basically have to wind up the music box that is Withered Freddy and keep it charged enough so he does not get angry and break out of his case. If he does, he goes and blocks the way to the puzzle that we need to solve. Now we have to go around this room and collect various gears and hopefully not get spooked by Balloon Boy's hello. It is truly the worst jump scare. Hi. 
So basically, you manage all the animatronics in the room so they don't kill you, and you collect all these gears, and then you are done. But now that we're done with that quick breakdown of how things work, it is now time to actually break things. So, as always, let's turn back the clock, because I want to talk about the title screen first. So, when you reach this area in the game, the title screen changes to be this Finance of Freddy's 2 area. And normally, we can only see this room through this one camera angle. However, if we remove the title screen itself, and we move the camera around, we can find some interesting things. For starters, Chica just straight up walks through walls. Anytime she appears in this room, and she warps around quite a lot, she always just walks straight through a wall. And Mangold is kind of the same way. Mangold normally comes out of the different vents, and in this room, they're also popping out of the left side of the screen and the right side of the screen. In all these various areas, Mangold is basically just kind of appearing out of nowhere. They're either floating in the room, or they just clip through a wall, and then they retract back through that wall. This is what Mangold looks like up in the vents too. They just retract into the vents, and then they freeze in place, and then they eventually warp somewhere else in the room. So what's kind of neat is that the first title screen area, that first escape room, is actually located right next to this one. And if we follow Chica as she walks through a wall, she will actually walk all the way over to this room. Normally these areas are not loaded in at the same time, but I can kind of do what I want, so uh, here they are. But now let's actually go back into the story mode, because we have some, um, interesting things to cover. So in order to fully explore this room, I want to make myself invincible. That way, I didn't have to worry about any of the animatronics killing me. So I basically turned off the collision so that jump scares could not trigger if I was touched by any of the animatronics. And so as you can see, both Chica or Mangold can just kind of walk inside of me and they don't know what to do because they cannot catch me. But it also makes the camera look really, really glitched and I cannot see at all. So, using my 10,000 IQ, I decided to separate the camera from the actual player. So I took the character controller, the person that we control, and then I took the camera, separate from that, and placed them in two different areas. And this caused Chica and Mangle to go after where the character is standing, but I could view them from an outside perspective. Now, you're probably thinking, this looks really, really weird, and uh, I don't really know what to say, so I'm not... <laughs> So I'm not sure if that's what they meant by the glitched attraction, but um, uh, here we are. Anyways, to avoid that, I decided to disable both Chica and Mangle. And by doing so, they basically vanished from the map. And so I really want to take some time to check Out of Bounds now. So this is what Out of Bounds looks like around this room. There's a lot of walls and flooring that sort of extend outward from the playable area, and they sort of just retreat out into the darkness and stop. However, there is something really interesting out here. So normally when you're inside, there is a window you can look through and you can see Foxy sitting on the ground in a hallway and they're glitching out. But we can actually enter this hallway from out of bounds. Now this hallway goes nowhere at all and it actually has just like a dead end on one side. But this is what Foxy looks like up close when they're glitching out. It actually looks really cool. And it's kind of a shame that we can only see this from far away through the window. But yeah, Foxy has seen better days. So we're gonna leave them out here and we're gonna head back into bounds now. So I mentioned earlier that Withered Freddy breaks out of his case. And this is what it looks like when it's happening right in front of your face. Now, I of course have nothing to worry about because he cannot hurt me because he cannot detect where I am. So even though he goes to block us, we can kind of just walk through him. I can also move him wherever I want, so I scoot him on the hallway a bit. Now at this point, I decide to turn both Mangle and Toy Chica back on. Except, um, something bizarre happened. Mangle had seen better days. They were basically dead. They were laying on the floor, deactivated, clipping through the ground, and for some reason, they were like rotating around me anytime I try to look at them. And although I want to laugh and say this is Chica's fault, I actually think what's happening is when I turned Mangle back on, my character's camera was facing a different direction. So this sort of messed up the orientation of Mangle and how he approaches the character. He basically had the wrong orientation when he was brought back into the game. And this reminds me a ton of what I did with Zardi in my own game, Zardi's Maze. A while ago, I was messing with Zardi and I rotated him and then assigned him back to his normal, like, chase down the player parameters. And every time I would rotate, he would move, like, with the camera in a circle. And this would cause him to glitch around the screen. And Mangle is doing that same exact thing, except Mangle is just straight up dead. F in the chat, fam. So there is no hope for Mangle. 
However, with Chica, um, I want to uh, mess with her too. So we start making Chica just wider. And a wide Chica is honestly kind of terrifying. But the thing is, there is no real limit to how wide Chica can be. So we make her even wider. Now at this point, she is asserting her dominance in this area. And she is basically shoulder to the shoulder with the hallway walls. And at this moment, Chica decides that she is too powerful for this world. So she just straight up walks through the wall and steps all over Foxy as she tramples him in that hallway. And before the whole game implodes, I put all that to a stop and we resume something a bit normal. Now, for the very last thing I want to talk about, I was taking the camera up above the room and looking around. And that's when I realized I never focused on the in-between room, the room between Balloon Boy and the marionette. There's actually a small space between them that has some interesting things stored within. There's like some weird small metal pipes or trinkets that are sort of just floating in here. But most peculiar is that there is a severed Freddy Fazbear hand floating in the middle of this area. At this time, I do not know why this is here. There's just a floating hand here and it's kind of creepy, but it is hidden behind the walls and you will never see it unless you clip outside the room. But with that, that wraps up our very interesting toy room experience. The Glitz Attraction's third escape room is called Cursed, and it is a recreation of Finest of Freddy's 3's Chaos. Springtrap will try to enter the office any way they can, while Dreadbear is on the assault too. Alongside them are three phantom animatronics, Foxy, Balloon Boy, and Chica. Now if you're new here, I like breaking games, so subscribe right now if you want to see your favorite horror games broken, alongside getting a sneak peek behind the scenes on how they work. Today, we're heading up into the vents to chase Springtrap, breaking Dreadbear, and exploring Exploring the outer hallways of the office you normally can't get to. So, I hope you enjoy. So for a quick recap, this escape room is honestly kind of difficult. You have to manage both doors and the camera system. But then, you have to turn your back to all of this to play through an entire arcade game. Springtrap will try to enter both side doors, or even the vent systems. So, you must shut the doors to keep them out. But Dreadbear will destroy the doors if they are closed, and come in to find you. You must hide under the desk to avoid Dreadbear all while avoiding the phantoms that appear around the map that can scare you to death. It's definitely difficult, at least for me. But once you clear the arcade game and solve the numbers, you'll get your combination that will allow you to escape and clear the room. Doing so causes Springtrap to chase after you, as they eventually get crushed by the vent door. Okay, so that's the recap, but now we're going to rewind a bit and go back to that title screen. So the title screen always has an animation for the room that you're currently on. And as you can see here, we have Springtrap and Dreadbear that sort of pop out from different areas in this room. And then we have Nightmare Balloon Boy who sort of just floats on by. Now, if we move the camera around, you can see the Springtrap is just hiding right out of the camera's view, either behind a wall or just on the edge of what we can normally see. He kind of like ducks down a little bit and it's kind of funny but not quite as funny as Dreadbear. Dreadbear pops out and it's sort of like spazzing all over the place, but when they retract out of view, they sort of just collapse through the floor. It's honestly really silly looking, but because it's out of view, the developers don't really have to worry about it. Now, what was most bizarre to me is Nightmare Balloon Boy. This dude just shoots off like a rocket through the map. And I was really curious, so I decided to follow Balloon Boy out into the great beyond. And they just keep going and going and going. I was very surprised to see how far out they actually go because there's not really a point because you would never ever see this at all. But yeah, Nightmare Balloon Boy in Space, the newest Five Nights at Freddy's fan game. But we're now done with the title screen, so let's actually go back to the main escape room now. Now upon starting this, I was most interested in the world outside of this office. There's a whole series of hallways and other things that we cannot get to. Because every time we try to leave this office, Phantom Foxy will jump scare us and then put us back inside the office. So there's basically no way we can leave. However, just outside those doors is two sets of objects. On one side, there is a Foxy mask on the wall. There's like these little gift boxes and there's a Foxy doll on top of them. And on the other side, we have a Freddy suit, a Freddy doll, and some regular cardboard boxes. And both of the hallways that these are in actually lead onward into like a fog. There's like this dark fog at the end of the hallway that sort of eclipses what is behind it. So of course, taking the camera out here is cool, but I actually want to take the player out here. So moving the player out here, we can actually walk around with a flashlight. And a lot of the objects out here don't have collision, but we can walk around the floor. 
Now, trying to move past these smoky hallways forces us to load back into the main room. No matter what I did, trying to move the player beyond this always caused them to teleport back to the office. Now there's this area called the dead zone, at least in the files itself. And this is what determines that respawn that happens. Anytime the player touches the dead zone, they will warp. But this is not gonna stop us. However, I do wanna show you some other things first. So Phantom Foxy will always appear outside one of the two doors and you do not want to look at them. This is what they look like up close though. And what's interesting is that they're actually stored out of bounds when they are not in use. So Phantom Foxy just sort of appears behind these walls in this nothing space. There's only flooring and walls out here, but they are stored here out of view until they need to be called upon to be placed back into the game area. Now, just behind the arcade cabinet that's in the corner of this room, we can actually find Phantom Chica just floating out of bounds in the void. They don't really move from here, they just sort of sit here, and um, yeah, they're pretty cozy back here. Now, of course, the office area and the hallways around it are only one small part of this map, because there's an entire vent system that goes on for a very long time. There's actually a lot of areas in the vents that are not covered by the cameras. And I find this surprising because there's almost no point, unless I'm missing something and there is a point later on in the game, but the vent system is a huge maze. There's lots of different paths and turns and there are giants like holding cells in the vents, like these big metal rooms that are all textured with the vent material that are just at the end of the vents. And I'm not entirely sure why they're there. But uh, speaking of the vents, if Springtrap exits the vents and he can't find the player, well, he'll just run in place like this. Springtrap, your running man dance is excellent, man. So now we're gonna take a quick break from the vents and talk about the camera rooms because so far you haven't seen the second half of this map. So you know those smoky hallways that we can't get past? Well, beyond those hallways is a series of rooms that are all linked together. And within them are the areas where the cameras can see. So the animatronics will appear in these rooms just staring at the wall. And through the perspective of the camera, it looks like they're looking up into the lens. But in reality, they're just uh, talking to a wall. Now we can bypass that dead zone I was talking about before. And by moving the player back here, we can actually explore these rooms. Now nothing back here has collision and none of the animatronics, to my knowledge, if they appear back here like instantaneously, in that case, none of them can hurt you. Now that is not always the case, but in this instance, we are safe. So yeah, we can just straight up walk through walls. And if we walk behind the walls and go to this giant floor area that's out of bounds, we can actually see that Phantom Balloon Boy appears back here periodically. They are very, very creepy in absolute darkness with only a flashlight, so it's major spooky town back here, but we're gonna head back into those rooms again. So both Springtrap and Dreadbear have the ability to walk through those foggy hallways and go back and forth between the camera rooms and the main office area. And while this is going on, Phantom Foxy is of course warping sort of out of bounds too, to these small little alcoves where they're stored. But what's kind of interesting is that if Dreadbear breaks into the room and then we disable them inside the room so we can walk around safely, upon re-enabling Dreadbear, they will just um, slide towards us. They don't walk, they just straight up slide right at us. And honestly, it's way more terrifying this way. They're like a phantom who can just glide and they'll chase us into the hallways where we normally cannot be and we'll still get jump scared. Now, of course, earlier I mentioned that Springtrap can take the vents. And normally we can only see this through the monitors at the front of the office. However, we can find Springtrap up in the vents and this is what they look like crawling through the vents. It's kind of strange because they're like crawling into this very bright light. And I get why they did this so that they would be front lit, but watching it from a different angle is kind of funny just because it looks like they're ascending to the afterlife. But when they make it to the very end of the vent, they will warp to the middle vent in the center of the office and they will drop down below and kill us. So this made me curious. What if we try blocking the center vent with a giant trash can? Well, so I stuffed a giant trash can up there, but um, <laughs> it didn't work. Um, Springtrap fell right through it, but I froze Springtrap in place, and then I started to mess with him. So apparently, this Springtrap model also has a hidden bow tie, and this bow tie is turned off and we can't normally see it, but we can turn it back on. 
But alongside this, we have full control over Springtrap. We can take him apart if we want. So I start taking off his face. I want to take off the mask of the suit and see the zombie face beneath it. And honestly, his face is very scary once you remove the Springtrap suit. Now, at this point, if we get jump scared by Springtrap, all of this will load back in because the jump scare animation is categorized differently than the actual model we see here. So getting jump scared, we'll put him back into his mask and we get stomped on. Now earlier, we talked about how Phantom Chica was out of bounds behind the arcade cabinet. And that is not the only thing that's stored back here, because the actual arcade screen is stored back here too. So even when the game is running, we can find the screen of the arcade cabinet back here. So this office has been turned completely upside down, and we've seen a lot of different things in here from overhead shots of the actual area to messing with the individual animatronics. But I want to take a moment to talk about the box that is inside the office. In a comment on the first video I ever did of this game, a viewer was asking if I could take a look inside the box to see what was inside of it. And so I took all the components out of the box and sort of spaced them out so you can get a better view. So there's lots of different animatronic parts within. Quite honestly, they put a lot of things inside this box, and I'm very surprised they all fit, because only in a video game would all these things actually fit inside this box. Putting the box aside, we now have the final chase that takes place in this room. So when you beat this escape room, Springtrap will chase you through the vents, and you eventually defeat them with the vent door by closing it on them. Now what the player cannot see is that when Springtrap gets hit by that door, they are tossed like a ragdoll beneath the map. So right beneath that vent area is the dead zone, an area I talked about before, a place that will trigger a respawn of the player in the center of the office. But as you can see, the endoskeleton is up above, yet Springtrap is like in free fall down below. Springtrap is frozen in place in this falling pose and no one knows they're down here. And that's incredibly sad. So we're just gonna leave them down here and have them think about all the mistakes they made. But with that, that brings us to the end of the Finest of Freddy's 3 escape room in the glitched attraction. The Glitch Attraction's fourth escape room is called Fun Times, and it's themed after Fun Nights at Freddy's sister location. However, it's the opposite of a fun time. Within it, we must deal with Fun Time Foxy, Fun Time Freddy slash Bon Bon, Ballora, and all the while, rebuilding Circus Baby. In this video, we're gonna take a look behind the scenes to show you how this area works from a point of view you'll never see. Except here, that is. Of course, I'm gonna break stuff too. We'll be exploring all the rooms you can't normally go in and finding some cool stuff out of bounds. So, I hope you enjoy. So I'm gonna do a very quick recap so we're all on the same page here. Upon entering this room, your goal is to rebuild Circus Baby. You need to find the CPU hidden in the room and plug it into the monitor. You must then have parts sent over so you can slowly put Baby back together and then sync those parts up with the torso. However, there are three threats you must manage. Ballora is quite the dancing queen, and she'll make her way into the room unless you turn on the Tesla coils and zap her to oblivion. You'll need to toggle the lights on Funtime Foxy to make sure they aren't having a seizure. And if they are, you'll solve that problem with huge amounts of electricity. The last obstacle is Funtime Freddy and Bon Bon, and Freddy will slowly wander towards the door. Enabling Bon Bon will have them talk and hopefully convince Freddy to go back to the platform and not kill you. As you solve puzzles and tasks on the computer, you eventually rebuild Baby and can exit the room into an elevator. Recap aside, let's jump in. So the first area on our adventure is the title screen, and we see the back half of this room, this sister location set, and we have Ballora and Funtime Freddy walking on by. Now they continually walk to the left and to the right, and they cross paths. And that's all this title screen has to offer in terms of the animatronics you can see. However, there is things going on in the background you cannot see. So for starters, both these characters, Ballora and Funtime Freddy, they basically walk out of bounds or through walls, and they snap back into place to basically walk past again. Now, of course, you're probably wondering, where is Funtime Foxy? Well, Funtime Foxy actually does appear in this scene, except in an area you can never see them. They are directly behind where the camera is facing for the initial title screen. So if we were to look around, you would actually see them waving and doing their stage getup, the thing they do actually in game, just out of sight of the camera. I'm not sure why they didn't include Funtime Foxy um, in this scene, similar to how they do in all the other scenes that came before this. But yeah, they are just hidden behind us and we can never see them. And this room itself is actually a stripped down version of what we see in the actual game. And a lot of it is barren because it doesn't need anything else. So now we're gonna head into the actual game. And the first thing I want to do 
of course, was fry myself with electricity. And I was a bit surprised you actually get an achievement for this. If you enable the coils and you walk into them, um, you get an achievement for having two brain cells. So you die, but you also win. So if we take a step back from this room and head out of bounds and look around, immediately you'll see that the electricity that's used all throughout this escape room is actually stored beneath the floor. You have your two Tesla coils that are constantly going off down here. And you have this like bright ball of energy. And this bright ball of energy is actually the electricity that is fired out of the shock gun inside Funtime Foxy's room. Now, down here, there's also this weird mechanical hinge. And honestly, at first glance, it made me think of the scooper from Sister Location. Now, I don't think that is what it is supposed to be, but perhaps some of you watching may know what this is. So please drop a comment down below if you can identify it. As we continue our trip out of bounds, there is actually a room stored away from this one that contains all of Baby's parts. Now I say the term room very loosely because it's actually like four intersecting planes of geometry and within you actually have both sets of legs and arms stored inside. So as you're going through this escape room and you're having parts sent to you, they're actually pulled from here and then they are inserted in the delivery elevator. Now, as we complete our final loop out of bounds, we come across some hidden rooms that, to my knowledge, I don't know how to get into, and we'll talk about these again later. But within this small closet space, there is a newspaper. And on this newspaper, it reads, Utah News, Corpse Stolen. An unidentified woman wearing a strange costume has stolen an old man's corpse. So yeah, this is just stored right here behind a locked door. And we'll come back to this later because this is an area that you go through when the chapter is ending. But overall, this entire sister location setup is pretty robust. We have multiple rooms, and the other hallway for Ballora that she goes down does have a dead end. It does not go anywhere, unlike the one that eventually leads us to the elevator. But now it's time to break into the rooms of the Funtime animatronics. So normally in this setup, you have these two rooms and both Funtime Foxy or Freddy can run out of these rooms and kill you if you wait too long. Now, Foxy's room is really neat inside and it's decorated with all sorts of party stuff. And Freddy's is full of all sorts of wires and other mechanical things. But while taking a free cam into these rooms is cool, I actually want to go inside of them as the player. So we do some construction and we remove Freddy's door. And this is what it looks like as we walk around this interior. Now, Freddy is currently removed from the game currently, but I'm going to add him back in in just a second. And when we do finally add Freddy back to the map, well, he's always designed to look at us. So as we move around, he will actually watch us very carefully. So Freddy actually cannot kill us. We can walk right up to him and we can actually walk right through him, which means we can get a first person view of the stomach hatch, which is within this model. And something else that is really neat is that Funtime Freddy does not actually walk out of the room. They warp to different locations around the room and they don't actually walk to those destinations. Now I found this really odd, only because the developers in turn did decide to have Freddy walk back to his starting location. So if you activate Bon Bon and Bon Bon convinces Freddy to go back to his platform, Funtime Freddy will actually walk at that moment. So it's kind of weird that they actually have a walking animation for this part, but they decide to not have a walking animation as he slowly exits the room. Now, before we leave this room, something else that is funny is that Funtime Freddy's face, his head, is always designed to look at the player. Now, I mentioned that before, but if we move behind Funtime Freddy, well, his head is going to turn upside down to try to look at us. And it looks very, very strange. So now that we're done with Freddy's room, we're going to move into the room of Funtime Foxy. And we can enter this room while Foxy is on stage and we are free to move around and there's nothing weird about it. But something that's interesting is that as time goes on, of course, Funtime Foxy starts to glitch out and then eventually they hunt down the player. Now, Funtime Foxy is designed so that they must walk to the front of the room before they can pursue the player. This is normally so they can exit the door, but because we're in the room, they do a 180 and they begin trying to find us inside the party room. Now, Foxy's pathfinding in this room is a bit glitchy because all the objects in here do not have collision and as they move between them, the pathfinding keeps recalculating. So we can make Foxy dance back and forth as they try to get to the player and we can technically prevent them from ever doing so. Now, of course, while we're in here, I want to shock Funtime Foxy. So I wanted to see what would happen if we moved Funtime Foxy off the stage, just off to the left a little bit. Would the shotgun actually aim at them? And it turns out it will. It will fire right at Funtime Foxy no matter where they're at in the room. And this is what that shock animation looks like up close. Normally you're looking through a window and you're really far away, but here's what it looks like up close. So what's interesting is that even though Foxy got shocked to the left, 
When their animation finishes, they actually warp back to the stage and they take that center position once again. Now, it is usually my goal to try to mess with all the animatronics in the area, at least in some way. Now I consider Baby one of those animatronics. Even though they don't hunt you down in this scenario, I wanted to see what would happen if I moved the parts over here so I could grab them without having to order them. But no matter what I did, um, the parts would just disappear anytime I tried to move them. So yeah, um, that was a bust, unfortunately. But we still have Ballora, and oh boy, do I have some plans for you. So first up, we're going to take Ballora apart. So Ballora is actually stored underground right next to those shock animations that I showed off earlier. She's just down here dancing. And when she's ready to pursue the player, she gets spawned in one of the two hallways up above. Now, the jump scares in this area are a bit different than the other areas. So I actually was not able to make myself invincible. But I needed some safety, so I took one of the computer monitors and moved it way above the room. And then I took the player character, the person we control, and I moved them on top of the monitor. So now we're using the monitor as a platform and we're above the room. This will mean Ballora cannot reach us. And so she comes out of the hallway and she starts running after us. Now, because we're in the air, she actually runs up against the wall and her torso arcs all the way backwards. So I guess her upper body is designed to always look at the player, similar to Funtime Freddy. But as she's frozen like this, we can begin our operation. So I start by removing some of the outside paneling. And this allows us to see parts of her endoskeleton within. But as we remove more things, parts of her go missing. Like her arms, her arms just straight up vanish. But as we completely remove most of her casing, her endoskeleton truly begins to shine. And by shine, I mean it's truly terrifying. And it looks like a wire alien. So, uh, we're gonna put her back together now, and then we're gonna try something else. Now, when Ballora gets shocked, she actually falls to the floor and she scampers away. And I really want to get a better look at this. So to start this off, I try moving her out of the hallway while she's actually dancing. And she'll just sort of freeze in place, and she'll sit there dancing. And of course, if we touch her at this point, we will die. But trying to catch her in the act of getting electrocuted from a different camera angle is actually very difficult because she takes forever to spawn and go through her cycle. I honestly spent like an hour just trying to get the shot, but eventually I got it and I picked the right hallway and she gets shocked. And then we can see from an aerial view, her scamper through the hallway back to the door on the other side. And when she gets beyond that door, which she just straight up went through, she unloads and then she appears beneath the map. So she goes back to her storage location under the map, but she's still in her crazy crawling animation. And what's really terrifying is her legs are actually bent backwards. It is truly nightmare fuel. So what's interesting is I spent a lot of time in this room trying to get this blower thing to work. And for some reason, out of bounds, there is like this little red light that is raising upwards. It never stops moving and it's continually moving upwards. And I don't know what it's supposed to be, but it's here and I thought I'd point it out. But now it's time to exit this room and proceed onwards. Now, when things wrap up, you have these little robots that come out. And in the files, these robots are called Joes? J-O-E-S. I'm not sure why they're called that. Perhaps you guys know, but that's what they're called. But when these guys spawn, we can now move through that right hallway. And the hallway eventually leads us to an elevator. However, we are now in that area with the locked doors. So there's two doors in front of us and we can grab the handles, but they do not open. So we just straight up get rid of the doors and delete them from existence. And as you can see on our left, we have the little closet that has the newspaper and on our right, well, that door didn't lead anywhere. It's a solid wall. Now I know there are supposed to be hidden buttons throughout the game, but I'm not actually sure how you get inside these doors or even if you can. Is this a leftover asset that's no longer accessible? It's hard to tell. But of course, if you know, drop a comment. So as we move through this hallway, the elevator room loads in and the previous area with Baby actually unloads. So now that entire sister location area is basically barren. There's nothing inside of it and all the objects are gone. It's actually pretty spooky this way. So as a player, we enter this elevator and it starts going downwards and then the mini Rena's cut the cables and then the elevator starts crashing and that's what takes us to the next section. Now this elevator area has tons of duplicate walkways underneath each other that all mimic the one we came in on. All of them lead to doors with nothing beyond them and if we keep moving way below this map, we'll eventually find a room with blue lights. Now after the mini arenas cut the cable, the elevator falls and it falls into this room down here and it shakes around and it actually seems like the elevator is falling, but it's just moved down here and it's the textured wall that creates the illusion that the elevator is falling. And with a mighty crash at the end, the fun times escape room comes to a close. 
The glitched attraction's fifth escape room is called Lost Media, and it can be a bit of a doozy. Ennard is hunting us down in the depths beneath the Cicer location area. In this video, we'll be taking another peek behind the scenes at how this game works, while breaking certain parts of it in the process. I'll also be tackling the elevator accident section as well, because there is actually a massive area cut from the game that I was able to restore. So I hope you enjoy. So as always, I like to do a quick recap so that everyone is on the same page for what normally happens in this area. You start off picking yourself up off the ground, and then head into some red tinted vents. This section is like a maze, but you eventually stumble your way into a room where all the animatronics from Sistral Location have combined into Ennard. Ennard starts punching the glass like a maniac, and your character runs away into the next room. You grab your Zardi's Maze flashlight, power up a solar panel, and head into the warehouse maze. Ennard is hunting you down in the darkness, and you must find a crowbar and then a keycard. You then must open a door with that keycard to start your work on the generator part of the escape room. Scared about are three stations that require you to solve challenges involving replacing fuses on a generator, and you need to grab the correct fuses from a bin to solve each station. Rinse and repeat three times, and a door will open and you can escape. But now, let's rewind time. So the first thing we're going to look at is the title screen, because it does update once we enter the warehouse area. So normally, you have this fixed shot, and you have Ennard who pops in all around the background. Now, just like the other title screens before this, Ennard is sort of just phasing through the floor. They kind of just crumple up into the ground, uh, just outside of the view of the camera. And when they move around the room, they just unload and then they appear somewhere else. But this room itself is actually very, very wide, and half the warehouse is missing. There's this big blank space up in front of where the camera's at, and normally, in the actual game portion, this would be filled with other shelves. But if we take a peek beneath the floor, we're actually going to find two floating screwdrivers beneath the map and a wrench. These tools are just flooding down here, and I'm not sure why, but nearby there's actually something that's way more interesting. So there's this endoskeleton down here that is in a T-pose, and <laughs> they're definitely asserting dominance down in this out-of-bounds area, but their legs are scattered so far away from them. And what I find pretty neat is that the legs are still attached. So we have these really long cables stretching from the bottom of this T-posing model all the way over to these different areas with the legs. There's one up above them on the floor of the warehouse, and then there's one like way out of bounds, like really far away. And you have this cable stretching from the leg to that body. Now this looks like a Freddy endo to me, um, just off the cuff, I've done no research into that, but if you know what it is, let me know in the comments because I'm curious. And that wraps up the title screen. The rest of the room is empty and very similar to the actual map, so we're going to move on to the actual game now. But before we get to this warehouse area again, we have a lot to cover. So although it's a very small portion of the game, there's this area known as The Accident. And the accident starts the moment you climb to your feet off the elevator and make your way through the vents. Now, there are these red colored vents that sort of are like a labyrinth. There's lots of dead ends, and you basically have to fumble your way through until you eventually come out on the other side. Now, this area is fairly short, and then you eventually find yourselves in the remains of the scooping room. But this vent area is actually hiding something really, really cool. So the vents you see here with this red, this is the final version that the developers move forward with. However, in the files, I was able to restore the old vent area, and it is massive. It is not closed off vents, it is a sprawling room full of many different walkways and ventilation systems, and beneath this room is a massive warehouse. Now, this is way different. Instead of going forward in the final version, and then going into that room, and then taking a left through that little crawl space to enter the vents, you instead just go straight forward onto this massive walkway. And all around you, surrounding you, is giant machinery, and there's like spotlights up above you, and there is these different paths that lead to different areas. Beneath you, you can see other walkways that have those emergency Joes, those little robots, just zooming across the map. And as you make your way deeper into this room, you eventually come across a crossroads. You have a choice to make, and there's three different paths you can go down. And to help guide you, there's actually developer text left over that is still written on these walkways. 
So in the center of these walkways are four labels. One says forklift room, one says the remains of the scooping room, another says stairs to the warehouse, and the last says Joe's maintenance. Now the inclusion of this giant room and this text really does show us that at one point, this area was a lot different. And not just visually. It shows you that in development, there was at least an idea that there was going to be some backtracking involved. It looks like you'd have access to these different places, and upon finishing the different rooms, you would have to backtrack and then move to the adjacent rooms across this giant room. Now, of course, I cannot prove that, but the writing is on the walls, or in this case, the walkway. And as I'm walking around, I can definitely tell that my computer is struggling. So it's either my computer is just really crappy, or I'm wondering if there was performance issues with the scale of this room. I'm dropping frames left and right. So was that a reason why this was scrapped? Was it that the idea or the flow of this room didn't work from a gameplay perspective? Or was it that this room itself was overly taxing on the game engine and someone's computer? It really makes you wonder. So the forklift path takes us back to the elevator crash area. And the scooping room path takes us to that same room in the final version of the game where Ennard is created. So these other two paths lead to dead ends. They come to these doors that we cannot open, and if we force the doors open, we'll see that nothing is on the other side. However, like I was saying, beneath this room looks like that warehouse area where we normally encounter Ennard in the final version of the game. So it makes me wonder if while you're up on the scaffolding, Ennard was lurking down below, beneath you, in this warehouse. And you have taken the stairs to the warehouse path to get down below to then encounter the Lost Media escape room. It would be kind of creepy knowing that Ennard was possibly down here. Now, of course, I do not know that for sure because the scooping room is still in the same location as before, which meant you probably would have needed to go there first in order to create Ennard through the cutscene, but perhaps there was not a door on the other side and then you backtrack to this main area. Now, before leaving this massive room, there's two other things I want to show. And one is I follow some Joes uh, down the path and they go in these little vent doors. And then beyond these vent doors, they just shoot out into the night sky and ride for a very long time before unloading. And the last thing before moving on is that the walkways of the final version of the game and this scrapped beta map do line up sort of near the scooping room. Now, the walkways of the beta map do not match up one to one with the actual location of the final scooping room. Room. It's misaligned just a little bit so you can't go through the door. But from this angle, you can see that as I toggle between these areas, they do lead to the same place. So from this point forward, we are no longer in the beta map, and we are back to the normal version of the game. So we enter this room, and we can see a cutscene of Ennard as they punch the glass. Now, it is possible to trigger this cutscene multiple times, because the trigger for it resets once you move out of the room and the screen dips to black. So, if we were to turn around once we get to Lost Media and force that door open, we can actually replay this cutscene by walking back to that trigger. And it sort of creates like this endless loop. But let's take a quick look into Ennard's room, because it is not as it seems. So if we trigger the cutscene and then we go in the room with our camera, you can see that Ennard, from their perspective, is actually just punching a wall. Now on our side it's glass, but from this perspective it's actually a solid wall. So the normals of this wall are actually on Ennard's side. And that's why we can look through it on our side and not see what they see. Now, taking the camera back there is cool, but I actually want to go back there myself. So we can pry some paneling off the walls and then force our ways through the door and we end up in this scooping room area. And all the objects back here do not have any colliders on them, which means everything can be walked through. There's no physics in place that will stop us from phasing through these objects. So we have an assortment of parts in this room, but what you can't see is beneath this room, we have more parts. And mainly, there is a headless Ballora who's missing other parts of her body. The remains of the model are just floating down here beneath the floor. So all of that wraps up the introduction to Lost Media, and now we're in the actual room itself. So around this entire escape room is flooring that you can walk on that sort of forms like an outer walkway. Currently, I'm behind the walls in an area you cannot access. But it's kind of cool walking around here and looking into the dark room, knowing that we're safe from Ennard. And speaking of Ennard, Ennard kind of walks aimlessly within the maze, and they don't teleport around. While actually playing this, I wasn't sure if the game moved Ennard around, like placed them closer to you when you got far away, but it appears that's not the case. However, I do find it funny that Ennard sort of walks like a T-Rex in the prowl. Now, if we disable the entire escape room itself and just keep the flooring, well, Ennard doesn't follow their normal paths. They will actually freely wander the room, and if they see us, they'll run directly towards us and not try to evade the objects that used to be there. 
However, in the essence of safety, I got on top of the shelves, and now Ender cannot get me at all. They have a hard time seeing me too, but when they do see me, well, they just look up at me and run up against the shelf. Trying to place Ender out of bounds at any point will actually make them walk through the walls and come back to their normal walking area. This is interesting because the player cannot walk through those walls, but Ennard can, despite not being able to walk through the shelves. So real quick, beneath this map we'll actually find those same objects that we found before on the title screen. The wrench and the two screwdrivers are down here, alongside the T-posing endo model with the stretched out legs. So it seems that when they copied this section to make the title screen, they just took the whole thing. Out of bounds objects and all. At this point, I wanted to mess with Ennard some more. So what I did was I made tons of copies of them, and they all were stuck on each other and stopped working. So watching them all like flow through each other is kind of funny, but also really, really creepy. So then I deleted all the innards but one, and I froze it on place, and I started to remove the parts from them. To the point where they were just floating parts in a mask. I then put them back together, and then made them a big boy. And this massive innard, who was looking over the shelves, could not hurt me. I could just run up against them and nothing would happen. Now, there is one final area that we still have to cover, and that is Vanny's secret lab. So within this maze, there is actually a purple key. And once we get this key, we go inside that room that we get access to with the key card, and we'll find a door with a purple lock. Using this key, we can access this secret laboratory. Now within this lab, you can find a tape and put it in the VCR. And once you do, a very sort of graphic video starts playing, where Vanny is killing this dude during an experiment. So what you see on the screen is not in the game itself. So this is not a projection, so to speak. This is actually a video file that's within the game files that is then called upon and played on top of the TV screen. Because of that, we cannot see this cutscene from a different perspective, at least from what I know right now. However, the body of the individual is still within this lab, and they are within a glass case. Now taking a look inside this glass case is a bit weird, because the body does look strange, and it's covered by like this cloth. Underneath that cloth, or that layer, there is no body, it is just an empty shell. But there are some hidden objects in this room that you cannot see. For one, and it's really strange, but there's a poster on the wall that was deleted. So if we put that poster back into the game, this is what it looks like. So the poster is about a man named Alfred C. Johns, who is age 48. He's missing from a Utah mental health facility since November 28th, 2030, which is quite a ways in the future. In this room, there's also an object that is an invisible knife, but it doesn't have any geometry and I couldn't restore it. But with the final coverage of Vanny's lab, that brings our adventure to a close. That was everything that Lost Media was hiding, to my knowledge, so I hope you enjoyed. The sixth escape room is the back alley, and it's based off of Five Nights at Freddy's 6, aka Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Scrap Baby, Molten Freddy, Music Man, and Scrap Trap all poses threats in this outside environment. In this video, we'll be covering this entire area to see what things are hidden and to see what things we can break. Beyond that, we'll be heading into the basement to take a look at the burn trap and Vanny cutscene. We have a lot to cover, so I hope you enjoy. Let's head into the back alley. As always, we start with a very brief recap. Your player emerges into this area and has several tasks that must be done. The first task I usually finish is the pizza minigame, where you must feed the hungry children. Clearing this gives you a prize in the projection room. Next, we must find three notes hidden around the map to get the combination to the key safe. This key lets us open the projector room. We grab our coin prize from the pizza minigame, pop it into this stationary animatronic, and then press these two buttons to get a bunch of flyer pieces. These must be moved around on the projector to make this flyer. And afterwards, we pull the lever and grab the shears that double as bolt cutters. We can then cut our way to the end of the escape room. Mind you, during all of this, we need to flash Molten Freddy to keep them away, and use a computer system to stop Scrap Baby and Scrap Trap. So, I always like starting these things off with the title screen. So, here we go. So, what you see here is the normal angle that you see on this title screen. We have Music Man off to the right, and we have Scrap Baby who walks back and forth, and we have Molten Freddy who pops out in front of us. Now, things look much weirder when we move the camera around. So first off, if we move the camera, we can see Scrap Baby just straight up walk through the fence and objects. They do not hop over the fence like they do in the actual game, and it almost seems like this Scrap Baby is using the same walking animation as Toy Chica from the earlier escape room. So although these title screens are usually a reduced version of the actual area within the game, Scrap Trap can still be found here despite the interior of this area not existing. 
But for some reason, Scrap Trap is placed beneath the ground, just floating off in the void, um, as if they are still sitting in their chair. This is beneath the ground, not far from where the Music Man is at. I'm not entirely sure why they kept him here, similar to how Funtime Foxy was kept in an earlier escape room, but here he is. Now my favorite part of the title screen is Molten Freddy, because they appear around this map and they seemingly drip down or extend outward from where they spawn. So for example, we can see Molten Freddy appear in the sky and drip down, but when they retract, they actually clip back through themselves. It looks pretty strange regardless of what angle you look at. But of course, this is something that the player would never see. Molten Freddy also rises and sinks into the floor, and underground, their torso shoots through their mouth. It's like they vomited up their own body. Now, in my opinion, Molten Freddy is the star of this title screen, but it is interesting to see where Scrap Baby also walks when they go through the corridor. Because they just walk straight into a wall, and then we can follow them out into the void and they just vanish. But that wraps up the title screen, so now let's go into the actual game. So upon booting this up, the first thing I want to do is head out of bounds. There's an entire forest area just beyond this fence, and I wanted to check it out. Now before we do that, I wanted to show off something near the ending. So if we hack our way through this gate, and we follow this down to the ending of this area, we can see that there is text put here to call out cheaters. It says, sorry pal, no end for cheaters. Apparently at one point, there was an easy skip to get back here, and it was something that speedrunners figured out. I just find it funny that this callout is here. So now we're gonna move past the fence and into the forest. And this forest area is actually pretty big. There's lots of trees scattered about, and there's even some hills and other earthy geometry out here. Now these hills will be important later on because in this video, we're coming back out here and doing an experiment. So just remember that they are here for the time being. So at this point, I want to start messing with the animatronics, and I need a safe place to store my character. Now, generally, animatronics can reach you almost anywhere on the map, unless you are placed above the map. So what I did was utilize that screen, the one that pops down to tell you how to basically survive in the escape room. This screen retracts back into the ceiling, and if we warp our character up above the ceiling, we will fall onto the screen and we can use it as a floating platform. So, now when Scrap Baby comes looking for us and jumps over the fence, they will get stuck running beneath the player. They have reached the player's position in terms of X and Z values, but they cannot reach us due to our difference in Y value. So, now they are frozen in place, and we can start to disassemble them. So the first thing to go on Scrap Baby is their outer casing, which is their outfit. And once that is removed, we can begin taking off the individual plates. Now this process takes a bit of time because there are a lot of different parts. But when all the plating is finally removed, Scrap Baby truly looks terrifying as an endo. Just look at that face. If that was chasing me, I would be truly terrified. We can also take out sections of the hair too, and this is what that looks like. Now that Scrap Baby is, well, scrapped, let's turn our attention to Molten Freddy. So normally, this animatronic loads and unloads from the map, but if we force them to load in before a position is set in one of the two corridors, they'll get stuck in place at the map's center like this. And at this point, Molten Freddy cannot actually move, so we can move them wherever we want. This is because when Molten Freddy spawns in, they normally have to follow a set path down the vent system until they come out of it. And once they come out, movement is restored and then they can freely roam. We normally flash Molten Freddy during this set movement path to avoid their jump scare and force them backwards in the vent. But if we move to the back of those vents, we can actually watch Molten Freddy appear. They just spawn in and the door opens up. And they both appear and disappear back here while the vent door obscures the player's view. So like I was saying, if Molten Freddy escapes, they can then chase the player around the map. And they will do so even through the locked gate. So if we head to the escape room exit while the gate is still locked, Molten Freddy will fuse through the gate and chase us down this corridor. Now, if we hop into the forest beyond the gate, Molten Freddy's gonna get hung up a bit trying to figure out how to reach us, but eventually they will figure out a way and they will fuse through a wall and then chase us through the forest. And this is very, very intimidating. So the one benefit we have to being out here is that the hills can aid us in avoiding Molten Freddy. Molten Freddy's pathfinding, which is basically the developer lingo for how Molten Freddy reaches the player, that direct path from animatronic to player, well, it does not anticipate when the player falls. So the player can take shortcuts by falling off these hills and ledges, but Molten Freddy has to go all the way around. 
Molten Freddy is constantly recalculating this distance and trying to come up with the best way to reach us. But eventually, we can toy around too much and get cornered. And then Molten Freddy will chase us through the Finest of Freddy's back rooms behind the walls. It's either Molten Freddy is going to kill us or the Void does. So we try our luck and jump into the Endless Beyond. And we can look up and see the level disappear above us. So upon reloading, now it's time to mess with Scrap Trap. This creepy fellow slowly moves in this chair until he eventually chases after you. And what's interesting is I actually had a glitch occur with Scrap Trap, where he froze in place during his pursuit trigger. So he's supposed to get up and run towards the player, but he actually got stuck in his chair. So walking up to him in his chair, which normally does not kill you, did kill me and it triggered the jump scare. But since Scrap Trap is stuck in this chair for a very long period of time, it's the perfect opportunity to take him apart. We remove his head plate first to see more of the skull. Then we take off his nose and his torso plates for the rabbit suit. Then we cut off his eyebrows and then his floating rabbit teeth. What we're left with is this creepy human skeleton face. He looks very, very terrifying from any angle. But even though he looks like this, if we do the chair glitch again and we trigger the jump scare, we'll see that his suit fully reloads during the jump scare. Moving on to our next victim, it's time to go after Music Man. Now Music Man is standing outside and he does not activate until after 15 minutes. But once he does, he behaves just like the other animatronics that chase after you. But during those 15 minutes, we can take him apart. What's kind of funny is that inside, Music Man is basically two black spheres with a tube connecting them. So once we remove the outer plating, that's what we can see. It's a really simple interior design. So now that we've covered this back alley area, it's time to move on. So we head into the basement area. And because this is a new place, that means there is a new title screen. So this basement is in the same room that the final cutscene happens in. So it's kind of interesting to create a title screen area for something that's so short. I mean, the player is going to spend maybe a minute or two in here, but then they move on. So in this room, Vanny appears in two different locations. And each time she pokes out of the walls and the doors. So she's basically clipping through a solid object like the other animatronics that we've seen before. And just like those same animatronics, they look a little funny out of bounds. Because when Vanny retracts out of bounds, she sort of gets all scrunched up. She folds up rather painfully as she hides outside the map. And this is very similar to the title screen vent area, which I did not show off in a previous video. In that, Vanny pokes out around the corners and does the same sort of animation. But now let's head into the area itself in the game. So quick recap, when you enter the basement, there's a computer you must walk up to. On it, you'll find various files to explore. But after a while, you get a warning that a human has been detected in the area. Unfortunately for you, it's Vanny and she whacks you upside the head. She then drags you across the floor into a different room before cutting you with a knife and taking your blood for a remnant experiment. Your blood is then given to Burn Trap as he emerges and eventually jump scares you. Now, turning back the clock, we can take a look at these rooms prior to entering them. So we can fly around up top and look at all the things within. Now, there is not a lot of interesting things in these rooms because all the objects for the cutscenes only load in when the cutscene is triggered. However, we can find something interesting beneath the desk, and that is an endo. And this endo is clipping through the floor, and its limbs are sort of stretched out. Now going back and activating the cutscene though, we can see this scene play out from a different point of view. So we are on the ground, and Vanny is basically clipping through the floor. This is done so she can be eye to eye with the player, and her bottom's out of view anyways. She then gets up and slides over to Burn Trap's container without moving her feet. And after she's done with Burn Trap's machine, she then walks through a wall and slides out of bounds. The lights go out and Burn Trap is moved across the room where the jump scare triggers. Now, there is one final area left to cover, which is the memory section of the game. Something that's quite small, but it's actually not. When wrapping this video up, I found tons and tons of things that I did not expect. Now, you might think this ending sequence is short, and you're right, it is. But I had no idea I would find so many hidden things left in this game. We have quite a bit to cover, so buckle up for the final deep dive into this game. So this part of the game's recap is very, very short. You basically come out of a slide and walk through a series of rooms that are isolated moments and memories. These follow the events of the FNAF 4 cutscene where the crying child gets bitten. At the end, you touch the plush toy, Fredbear appears behind you all creepily, and then you see the protagonist morphing between being a human and becoming an endoskeleton. That's the recap, short and sweet. 
So starting off, the title screen for this area doesn't actually have a whole lot in it. There are no animatronics and there are only moving lights. So in terms of finding something new out here, well, there isn't anything. What we see is what we get and there isn't anything I could find hidden in this area. But that's okay because there's plenty hidden in the game itself. So the six rooms that we go through are actually not loaded until we touch that door handle in the previous room. If we were to take an overhead look at all these rooms, only the animatronics and the children are present at all times. You will also notice that the slide we came in on is basically just a macaroni noodle. It is cut off right around the bend. And just because I know some of you are curious, there's a locked door in the final room and there's actually nothing behind that door. So even though this video is about this final area, these six rooms are actually the least interesting thing about this final map because it's what's hidden out in the darkness, deactivated, that we want to see. Like a giant glitch trap. Yes, this giant glowing purple face is actually a 300 foot tall glitch trap hidden out in the darkness. Now at the moment we can see his face, but given the background, we do not have the capability at the second to see his full body. But once we restore other parts of the map in a few minutes, we will be able to see his body as clear as day. Well, <laughs> sorta. Besides a giant glitch trap, we can find a mysterious door out here as well. And what's interesting is that we have this single door on this grayscale flooring, and it's just dark all around this area. And this door has several deactivated states, and we can walk up to it, but we cannot go through it. But looking around this weird liminal space, it's just spooky and eerie. It feels like a place you would encounter in a nightmare. Something else that's interesting is that it looks like this final memory area used to have reflective water or some sort of substance too, because there's a massive amount of it here, but it's deactivated. And all these things sort of lead me to the next area. Like they're all like these digital breadcrumbs and they're all really interesting. The giant glitch trap and now this door, but now we have something that's really interesting and it's the back alley area. So the back alley area was also once the building entrance and we can find it out here disabled and if we re-enable it we can find some pretty interesting things. For one, we can just find Vanny standing frozen in place outside the building. The sign next to the door that says the glitched attraction is flickering and certain parts of this area just don't exist. However, for reference, we're actually not too far from that mysterious door that we were talking about before. It's just beyond the vents. But what's interesting about this outside area is that the fields around it go on for quite a while. We can walk out to this massive grassy yard and we can see that the chain link fence abruptly stops, yet the underground basement area is missing. There's nothing out here but grass though, so we're gonna wander back towards the building now. So some of the mechanics here on this map are currently stripped. So, for example, we can go over to those vents that Molten Freddy normally comes out of, and we can flash those vents. That flashing mechanic does work. However, trying to go over to the computer and using it, well, that doesn't work. The computer is really broken. Everything is like activated at once, but all the functionality is stripped. But next to this computer is this magnificent door. And this door is magnificent because behind it is every environment in the game. And we have the capability of loading them all in. But doing them all at once is a nightmare. And it makes my PC crawl for obvious reasons. We got Nightmare Fredbear clipping through the floor and sneaking up on Toy Chica. We can disable this and then turn on the FNAF 3 area with Dreadbear. And if we remove the front door, we can walk inside too, and none of the animatronics can hurt us. Toy Chica is frozen in place, and the FNAF 2 area is all sorts of glitchy. Now, anytime a animatronic is activated, they do a little animation, and then they freeze in place. So that's ultimately what we're seeing here. So, when we toggle on the sister location area, it's a very similar experience. The environment pops in and overlaps the existing map, but we are free to explore it. However, in this sister location area, the shock button doesn't work, and the computer has seen better days for sure. One of the hallways is blocked as well, due to the outer walls of this building clipping through it. Now if we swap to the actual back alley interior, this will put Scrap Trap at the front door for us. And we can even walk inside this cursed building and grab the pair of shears. So essentially these environments are basically massive copy and paste into this one single region. This broke some functionality, but this brought over most of the items that were normally in that scene. But things get weirder though, because a mini floating vanny can be activated next to the life-size one. And there's also a strange untextured burn trap that is floating outside the building too. I'm not entirely sure why this dude's here, but this is probably the weirdest animatronic I've found yet, besides the massive glitch trap. And as you can see by the sign, 
Perhaps all this makes a little more sense now. So the strange from the building is actually the leftover remains of the area that they filmed and recorded all the promotional materials for the game. This was their stage for getting video clips and photos. We got some randomly placed endos uh, clipping through the ground over here uh, as they're leaning up against the building. But as we delve deeper into the leftover data, you'll see something very familiar. Uh, and it's not this. <laughs> I accidentally loaded every animatronic in the doorway at once. But this, this is what I meant. We have all the animatronics posed outside the building, and they are all frozen in place. Trying to flash Molten Freddy does nothing, of course. And we have some Z fighting on the walls with overlapping geometry. But this setup was used in the promotional banner on Game Jolt. They set up the stage to take a cool banner image, and it's still in the game files. If we head into the building during this banner shot, we could find Scrap Trap at his desk, but his head will always turn and watch us. He could not hurt us though, but it's just kind of creepy. Overall, this area is super cool. It feels like walking through a photograph, because in many ways it is. But now let's go back to that glitch trap. So we can toggle on these massive storm clouds that are very bright for some reason above the map, but we can use these clouds to actually get a good look at the giant glitch trap I mentioned before. So moving this massive lad over here, we can see his body is completely textured with sal black, minus his face. And we can see he's in a strange leaning pose. So I shrunk him down in size quite a bit, despite him still being super tall. The mysterious door can be seen for reference in the background, but with all the stuff running, my PC is starting to crawl. We can turn these two things off and get a good wide shot of the full map up here. Hopefully being up here gives you some context about how big this map actually is. But now let's go way back to the actual memory section and go to that final room with the plush. Because when we activate the plush, we can see that Fredbear totally just appears behind us during a cutscene animation. He just snaps into existence. And the second this is over, the scene where we're turning into an endo actually takes place above this room. If we move the camera up there, we can see an endo skeleton is up here and the arm is stretched out and away from the torso as the morphing effect is taking place. When I first played this, I actually had no idea how they pulled this off. So it's kind of neat to see. Now with this, this takes us to the end of the game, but we have, uh, I guess, two little things to show off still. As a bonus, we can check out the gallery, which is the extra area on the menu. And by manipulating the game, we can activate a ton of animatronics all at once. We're basically creating the blob ourselves with this extra mode. Now, this map doesn't have anything beyond the walls. The floor just goes out quite a bit, but that's it. But now that we've come to the end of the adventure, it's time to show off all the title screens at once. Uh, there's a lot we couldn't see before, but now we can if we remove the haze from the map. And I'm just gonna cut through a bunch of different shots right now as I talk, because honestly, a lot of this stuff are things we've seen before, but the layout itself is awesome to see with everything side by side. There are some things I did not mention before though, which are new. So I'm pretty sure I missed the ventilation title screen area because it's so short and the title screen cycles to the next escape room. But we have Vanny here clipping through walls like the glitchy rabbit she is. There's also a random cup of soda floating out in the void that I missed before. And there's a random piece of metal out of bounds in the sister location area. And just like before, another copy of all these environments exist, stacked on top of each other in a similar layout that we just covered. Seeing a full zoom out of all these places is really cool though. With that, the glitch attraction is finally done. It was a very long adventure going through all these things, but I really hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe now if you did, because there's plenty more of Finest of Freddy's coming, and of course, I hope you enjoy those videos once they drop. Thanks for watching, and cheers.